Okay, well, I'm Greg Lang from Michigan State University. We're here in the seventh region of Chile looking at a young orchard. This is the third year for this orchard. It's a very high density in contrast to an orchard we had just visited, and we're going to make some comparisons between that orchard and this one. That orchard was planted on a very vigorous rootstock colt with uh, lapins as the scion and was a very strongly growing three and a half meter. Uh, 15 foot tall trees. In contrast, we're on a sour cherry rootstock here, Cab 6P. It's a sour cherry rootstock out of uh, Italy. It promotes a little more precocity into the varieties, and the variety that we're standing here looking at, I believe, is Lapins. Let's see. The grower here uh, with us is uh, Fredix Bustamante. And uh, he has described how he's trained this training system uh, on these trees. And it's a very nice contrast with our last orchard because he told me that on average in this V trellis, there are 26 lateral branches, fruiting branches. So the fruiting units within this training system are 13 on one side of the V and 13 on the other side of the V. Ultimately, his plan is to renew those branches uh, a portion of them every year so that he always has about 10 laterals on each side of the V fruiting. So it's a nice contrast with the last orchard because we see trees here that are only uh, at most two and a half to maybe three meters high, more like two and a half meters, but we still have 26 laterals for fruiting compared to the other orchard where we had trees that were 15 feet tall and uh, <clears throat> uh, three and a half meters and they had 25 or 26 fruiting branches. The branches on those other trees were seven feet long. The branches on these trees are about two and a half to three feet long. That was one of the nice contrasts. Another interesting contrast that Fred ex uh, explained to me is how he developed these trees. Uh, they were planted as whips, a single leader tree from the nursery. They were headed here where we wanted to develop the two V scaffolds, or two V leaders. So about uh, 30 inches high, and they were headed prior to uh, significant spring growth. And those two leaders grew through the first year up to about seven feet. So I put all seven feet of leader on each side of the tree in the first year. Didn't worry about lateral branches. Then the second year, they came in and they notched and painted promalin to develop the fruiting laterals that you see. So as we stressed at the last orchard, establishing that root system during the first season gives the tree the strength then in the second season to put out quite a few lateral branches. And so in this case, he developed 20 to 25 lateral branches in the second year, all of relatively equal vigor. And so you have very nice balance in the tree. One of the contrasts between this orchard and that orchard uh, deals with the um, nutrition of the orchard. And you see the spur leaves on these laterals are very small. So that's something that he's going to have to stay on top of as he continues to develop this very nice structure from a structural focus into a fruiting focus. We need much larger leaves in the laterals to support the kind of crop load that's going to be put on this small statured tree. And so to do so, we'll be talking about uh, different timings of fertilization to make sure he's getting the nitrogen to the tree, both during shoot growth stage and in building the storage reserves for the next spring, because that storage reserve uh, production is what drives the leaves, the spur leaves in particular, in the spring. Now the second issue we'll talk about is irrigation uh, because he's using some deficit irrigation in the orchard to reduce growth and keep these trees in their space. So the timing of that deficit irrigation is also very important for building those reserves and ultimately building big leaves which will be used to build big fruit. Uh, for the uh, remainder of this segment we're going to turn to Lynn Long to uh, analyze the growth and the um, training techniques that have been used so far. Hi, I'm Lynn Long from Oregon State University. 
And we're standing in, I think, a really very interesting uh, block of cherries here. First of all, there, there's a number of things that I have not seen before here, and one of them is the size of these berms. This is located in an area with a very high water table, and so to, to deal with that situation, because cherries don't like a lot of water around their root system, they've raised the, the level of these uh, these planting beds here actually lowered the area in between the planting beds to three or four feet above where I'm standing right now. That provides for good drainage and allows you to grow in an area where you wouldn't normally be able to grow cherry trees. Uh, throughout Chile you see this type of a system um, on planting on berms, but I have never seen it to this extent where the, these trees are so much above the, uh, the, the ground level. And because of that, uh, you have to be uh, doing a few unique things in order to harvest these trees because obviously that makes these trees quite a bit uh, taller than where I'm standing at this point in time. So they've developed certain ladders to, to harvest the, the fruit off of, uh, off of this system here. So I think that's very interesting. The other thing that, uh, that is interesting is that this is an angled fruiting wall, a V-trellis type system here. And I, I generally like that type of a training system for cherries. Uh, I think they've gonna, done a good job of developing the system here. Uh, this is in the third leaf, and so the system is, is young. Um, it's, it's going to take some work in order to keep this system uh, vigorous and growing. Uh, Greg Lang mentioned that these were on uh, cab 6P, so you've got somewhat of a dwarfing rootstock here. Uh, again, somewhat precocious rootstock as well. And so they're, they're taking advantage of some of those uh, attributes of the root system that, that will help to produce uh, a large quantity of good quality cherries. The fact that these trees are close together, they're uh, just a little over um, three feet apart, maybe four feet apart here. These are lapins um, on cab 6P. Um, and it means that you don't have to get a lot of cherries on each individual tree in order to produce a lot of fruit per acre or per hectare. My concern, what I'm looking at here, is that we've got, if I can just climb up this berm here, we've got horizontal branches here that have relatively small leaves. And if you look here, uh, there's no vigor. And, and, <sighs> You've got to have vigor at this level, at, at eye level, in order to keep these trees uh, productive and growing good quality fruit. And uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the lack of vigor that I'm seeing at eye level. In fact, if we look at, up at the top of the tree, we don't see a lot of vigor in the top of the tree either. And so that is going to need to be dealt with in order to get better quality fruit off of these trees. Uh, we talked to the grower, he said that in his third leaf he was getting fruit that was about 26 millimeters in size. That's about a ten and a half row cherry. A uh, third leaf, um, you know, that may be okay, but certainly as these trees mature, you're going to want larger fruit. And I think that they can produce larger fruit with this type of a system, but first they need to deal with, with the vigor. Um, I think a couple of things are happening that's taking the vigor out of, out of these uh, trees here. One is the fact that these branches are horizontal. This is on a, as I mentioned, a uh, semi-dwarfing rootstock, bringing these branches down to horizontal, maybe taking out too much vigor. I think one of the other things that may be happening is the fact that this berm is so large, and here we are in, uh, in Chile, a very hot climate. We may be heating the root system here, and in addition to that, the fact that this is a berm may not be able to keep enough water in the, uh, in the uh, soil to keep these trees vigorous. So um, there's a couple of things going on there. And then I, I think that what also needs to happen is that the fertilizer regime needs to be changed. All the fertilizer that has been applied in this orchard was applied in the springtime. In order to get reserves for the following year, I think a portion of that um, fertilizer, the nitrogen, needs to be applied in the fall. And that will put the nitrogen in the, in the buds and will provide those buds um, more energy as they begin to grow in the spring. 
So those are, um, those are some of the things that I see um, right off. Um, I, what, I like the amount of light that I'm seeing down at, at uh, ground level. One of the things that you need to be looking at as you uh, determine your, um, whether or not your pruning regime is effective, I'd like to see modeled light touching the ground. And if I'm looking over here on this side where, where the uh, shadow is, and that's, that's exactly what I'm seeing. So I think that there's good light distribution in a system like this, and that'll help, of course, keep the fruit down here and the, and the spurs alive and active, and uh, uh, we, can, we can grow good quality fruit in the lower portions of these trees. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that they have in Chile and we have in other parts of the world, in fact, most parts of the world where they grow cherries, is bacterial canker. You'll notice that these trunks have been painted with a Bordeaux mixture, Bordeaux paint, and uh, they believe that helps to reduce the amount of bacterial canker in this, uh, in this climate. Um, watching the time of their pruning also helps with that, so you want to minimize the amount of, of dormant pruning, especially you want to avoid rainy periods when you're, when you're pruning. Um, the other thing though that, that may be encouraging bacterial canker in this orchard is the fact they put on uh, 300 kilograms of, of nitrogen per hectare, or about, about 300 pounds per acre, and that's a lot of nitrogen. And I think that encourages bacterial canker uh, infection. And so uh, I would uh, recommend cutting back on that uh, and also spreading that out at least two different applications, if not three. So all in all, I, I like the training system. Um, I like the, uh, the, the, uh, the looks of the trees, but I think that there needs to be more vigor put in the lower portions of the tree, and I think that there's, there's some things that need to be, uh, that can be done in order to uh, make that happen. Okay, well, we were talking about those damn horseflies and where they came from. You can see here why we've got damn horseflies around biting limbs in my legs as we're trying to video. But what we wanted to talk to you about today is use of mechanized platforms for orchard systems to improve labor efficiencies. Well, here's a situation where we're on high berms. We've got branches that are very high, and yet uh, these guys have come up with another solution. You just bring the huasos in and uh, have them work their way down the orchard uh, platforms, uh, not platforms, but scaffolds, picking fruit. Um, these guys don't eat too much. Uh, they don't use any diesel. Uh, in fact, they fertilize the orchard as they work their way through. So it's a win-win situation. Just more innovations brought to you here in Chile.